All right, so the video upstairs is um, called Apartment, and uh, Abbas actually helped me out with it a little bit. Um, um, as an assistant, not yeah. a collaborator. Yeah, 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 not as a collaborator. So, but I was making these paintings before I made the animation, and the animation itself is um, is not is made is is painted with cell with cells, which is plastic sheets where you an animation technique where there's anim there's 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 cells, plastic sheets, and you paint acrylic paint on them. It's kind of like Bugs Bunny ca cartoons where they have you have kind of a stationary um, backdrop, and then you, the image moves. Um, based on these um, paintings that you do on the on the transparent sheets, but before that, um, I was making these oil paintings um, based on. Um, I, I think this is based on. Um, well, th there were a lot of watercolors that were being painted in the 18th and 19th century by women, um, and uh, and I really was really drawn to the interiors. I I tend to think of myself as a bit of a, bro a baroque artist. Um, and so I, and I was also interested in this this intersection between <clears throat> power, aristocracy, and the animal. The aristocracy being um, the kind of exceptional figure that's high, like very high in the hierarchy, and then the animal being excluded, and exceptional based on the exclusion from <clears throat> from our species as humans. And so. I kind of conflated that in these spaces. So this is one painting called Two Dogs. It's encaustic, right? Oh, there's wax too. Yeah, there's wax on top. I painted into the wax. And um, yeah, and this is one, uh, another one. So I made a, a series of maybe 10 of them. They're quite small. I also made a, I forgot, I made a series <clears throat> a couple of years ago um, based on the aristocrats in zoos as well, so actually zoo architecture, which would have been appropriate. I should have put a, put them in there, but um, forgot. Anyway, so these are the interiors, <clears throat> and many of the interiors are also um, used for the animation. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to show you these as a uh, starting point. These were made also 10 years ago, and I think it's maybe a good idea to see where I was at. Um, and then I made these paintings, actually, this is how you see them. Um, I call them my spill painting series, and uh, quite large, kind of human scale. And so what happens is that you see, when you approach them, you see these uh, black enamel spills. And then as you get closer to them, you see yourself, but you also see that there are hidden paintings, enamel paintings, and behind in the mirror. Um, so there's this kind of visual trickery which I'm interested in. And so what you actually end up seeing in fragments, because the images are quite close to the mirror, so you have to kind of walk across um, and look around. So this kind of voyeuristic thing that happens. Um, and so these are the ones, this is what you see, but you wouldn't normally see it this way. I'm just kind of cheating and giving you a view of what you normally, um, is normally not seeing uh, right off the bat. So uh, this is the kind of imagery that, these are all on the same, all the images I'm showing you are all on the same um, plane here. So I made a few different ones, but this is just to give you an idea of how it works. And it's relevant to, um, the direction my practice went. So I'm, I'm going to be showing you a, a bunch of work up to just what I showed a few weeks ago. So this is quite relevant, I think. So there's enamel, black enamel, and then in behind there's um, painted enamel uh, imagery. And a lot of it's based on um, National Geographic images, or uh, I have an image file an archive that I collect that's organized according to I know, everything from flowers to um, war imagery to food. Um, so I end up using a certain kind of imagery over and over again. And it, it seemed important at the time to organize them so that I can find things quickly. And then just a few years ago, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit, um, <clears throat> I started working with uh, colored ink. I was really interested, I was in Paris and came across this ink called Sennelier and it's, I think you can purchase it here. I found it in Vancouver. 
before. Um, it is uh, kind of Indian ink with varnish in it. So I was really interested in, um, in the quality of the ink when it dried, it's still shiny. And it, it had some pretty interesting properties. Um, the thickness, it kind of held its form. And so what I was doing is making, um, I was making these images from an eyedropper and I would just drop one color into another and then based on the fact that the paper, the Opalux paper has this shiny coating that kind of resists a bleeding, it kind of sits on top, um, it would, they would combine and they would also ripple like this and then so you get these kind of strata. So they end up looking like hamburgers or organs, I don't know. They have an interesting, or even like layers of rock. And I, and I was also making these with the same materials, but drawing, and these are my rebus. If you have any questions about them, just feel free to ask. Um, <clears throat> I was interested in, um, do you know what a rebus is? It's a, kind of an old style um, word picture puzzle where if you read out if you say what the thing is, you can, it makes a sentence. So I was interested in this, uh, this as a kind of um, tapping into the unconscious, kind of dream imagery. They don't actually say anything, but I kind of like the idea that people might try to <laughs> find some meaning in them. <clears throat> and this is again based on an archive of imagery, and I, I kind of like how they look like samples of tattoos. Or I would I would put a few of these on as tattoos if I was into it, but. Um, yeah, so it kind of gives you an idea of the maximalist um, aesthetic, I guess. What else can I say about them? A lot of them are just recycled too, like the, the kind of uh, piggybacking of one person onto another on the far, your far left, I guess. Yes, there, it's based on kind of erotica drawings from the 19th century. but. Um, I made sure the brown person was on the bottom. It goes lighter and lighter. And that's something that I've played with in the past like, <clears throat> on some books and just different drawings that I like to revisit. And then I was fine. I, I've, I've been working a lot also with um, medical imagery books and the kind of attraction repulsion. Um, quality of them, not really wanting to see them because they gross me out, but then being very, very interested in looking at them. <coughs> and then seeing faces. So I accentuated the face like quality. And so these are all the same series at the same time. Um, so jumping ahead to now, I think you'll see, I'm, I'm trying not to make too much of a narrative, but um, hopefully you'll see kind of the visual links. Um, so what happened a few years back with uh, Deepwater Horizon, uh, obsessively watching the water gushing from under um, below and always seeing that image and feeling really super anxious. Just the idea that it's like keeps, it is still gushing and no one could do anything about it. And like feeling like super upset about what's happening to the planet. And then looking at these images more recently again for inspiration, which is kind of obscene, but uh, it's part of my, I guess my interest in the aesthetic of it, but also in wanting to say something about the world and um, yeah, what can you do? But uh, it was leading up to a a mural project I've, I've been working on. So these are um, in preparation. This is kind of research material in preparation for. Um, yeah, tailing ponds do. Yeah, so tailing ponds are um, the waste material left over after mining or um, bitumen refining, like the refinement of, of tar sands. So all the waste gets put into these huge, so you can get a sense of the scale from that bus going by on the asphalt road. Um, so they're, you know, they're huge artificial water systems and, you know, uh, sea li uh, um, birds and other creatures don't realize what they, that they're poisonous and they sometimes get caught in there. So I wasn't, you know, looking at these pools, the way that the materials flow. 
this one, which almost looks like a leaf. And you can see the road going up to it and, you know, it would just be dumped in there. And then all the runoff, it creates these effects. It kind of look like, you know, Yellowstone National Park or something, <laughs> which I've always been interested in too. Um, And, and so my early experiments um, with making paintings uh, with bitumen and tar were to um, just see what the materials do. So I was uh, actually ordered, ordered the bitumen. I couldn't, it was hard to get the bitumen and I was worried about the toxicity of it. So I, I ordered it in powdered form and I, um, I learned to make paint uh, to grinding it with linseed oil. And then when I went to paint, I would um, thin it down with a little bit of um, um, a gamsol, which is a kind of low, um, um, what do you call it? Like a less toxic form of turpentine or solvent. And making these quite abstract forms in that are, you know, were inspired by these, but I would just kind of let the materials do their thing. And then I, uh, I decided that I wanted to see what would happen when you would drop with an eyedropper um, the bitumen material into acrylic paint, which is also a petroleum-based product. Um, so I wanted, I, I thought, well, the, the goal would be to take resin, synthetic-based materials, and the kind of natural materials from the earth and combine them to make, to, make, to comment on um, artificial paint colors and um, paint, as well as the kind of naturals and the uh, um, petrochemical industry. So uh, these are just, a, I would buy different kinds of acrylic-based clear materials, and then I would drop the bitumen-based um, oil paint that I made into it to see what effects I would get and what would be the best combination in order to create um, these forms for a final work. This is all preparation for a final work. And then I would write down what the materials were exactly so that I had a, a <clears throat> I could track what was working and what wasn't. So that when it, because it takes a long time to dry, it would take you know eight, eight to 10 hours to dry before, and you could see what the result was. And then I started working with different colors and sometimes just circular forms. And then I was really interested in the, what the text was doing, so I decided I wanted to incorporate the text with, within the painting. And the calcomania is, is when you, would, you press, I'm really interested in materials, obviously, when you would you throw the paint down onto the surface and then you would smush it down with another surface and then peel it back and then you get these organic, sometimes almost landscape-like forms at other times I would be, like the one at the bottom is shellac, um, poured into a uh, pouring medium, like just an acrylic clear base to get these kind of grotesque forms yeah. with, with those experiments. Um, so that all those experiments ended up um, helping to figure out how to make this mural. And then, so you see what the mural is. Um, and then while I was doing, well, before I was working on that really, or at the same time, I was, um, there was a huge storm in, in, um, in Vancouver at the end of August, and it was unusual in that we don't get wind storms usually until fall, and that it, it was, a, they say that it's a result of global warming, just changes in climate and how the deciduous trees, um, before the leaves fall, they act like a sail. So if there's a really big wind, it will knock all the trees down. And these are really old growth trees. Um, a lot, most of them um, have their root systems at the surface. And um, they just couldn't withstand the, the wind. And so we had hundreds of trees fall down and there were a lot of electrical outages. So um, I went around the city looking for these trees that had been knocked down. This is one of them. I called the city and I asked them if I could have this one. And they never got back to me. So I ended up going through a circuitous, you know, whatever you end up having to do in order to find the right person. And um, ended up coming across this tree, 
on Spanish banks because they were uh, they had so many of them they just had to stockpile them so they had parks and they had them on the beach and um, before they got rid of them all I found found this one and then I went to a research forest in Maple Ridge which is a, you know an hour outside Vancouver and found um, this tree which had a lot of growth around it so um, this one was the result of just uh, research logging and I had this idea that I wanted to do a piece about stumps just because I have a pretty strong relationship to stumps based on my childhood. I won't go into the story, it's kind of sentimental, but <laughs> um, it's all relevant, you know, like, like history. And then I was, these, these photos were taken just after the Great Fire of Vancouver, where Vancouver itself was completely burnt down except for, you know, a few, and then what was left over, these stumps. So I, I found these images from um, 18, just 1886, just after the fire, like very evocative of uh, you know Vancouver before, and then Vancouver after. And the site of this a mural is um, downtown financial district of Vancouver. The two largest buildings are facing each other. There's Shangri-La Hotel, which this one is next to, and then across the street is Trump Tower. There's been a lot of controversy around Trump Tower being there. So, and then I was kind of interested in how these two trees are also facing off too. So there's this kind of interest in um, a pissing match or something, right? Um, but also the idea that maybe one is watering the other. And there are huckleberries growing on that little island and salmon berries. And so there's, there's constant life growing on the stump. Um, and quite like this kind of crotch of life in the corner. And uh, so the inspiration behind this work is um, this kind of medieval concept of the chain of being, uh, which is that the very bottom of the tree is um, you find the elements, rocks, and then as you go up the chain of life, uh, you go from inferior to superior, where the kind of trees and then insects and you know, birds. And then at the top, you see there's, there's God, and then there's this kind of lounging Christ and kind of falling down, <laughs> and the angels. And anyway, so this is loosely, you know, there in the work. Also, as you can probably remember from the, the Rebus. Paint, paintings um, interested in this aesthetic, which isn't kind of a reaction to Darwin's um, descent of man, to going from at the top the you know microscopic life forms down to primates. <clears throat> in preparation for the mural, I did all these silhouettes, and the, these silhouettes are actually going to be um, vinyl. Um, a vinyl work on the front of the library, so I thought I'd put this in just to show you. These are a few specimens, you know, maybe one thirteenth or something of what will be there. So, but these were used for the mural, so I'm getting a little bit of mileage from them. And this, stru these structures are the roads um, that were inspiration for this. Well, it's a pyramid, but it's also an asphalt road because the pyramid is made of tar. So I was painting with tar, which, by the way, is the worst thing to use, just for anyone who's interested in painting with tar, think twice. <laughs> it's quite nasty to work with. But um, yeah, it was. these are very strong images in my mind in terms of the really high horizon and then um, you know, the very um, melancholy context of the road within and some keepers paintings. I won't go into it because I want to leave space for others to talk, but these, no, I know, but it, it can actually go, take a long time to explain. So, and this is kind of a um, reaction to revolution, um, 10 years, 100 years after the French Revolution, James Ensor made this crisis entry into Brussels, and I see this, and I didn't even realize these paintings were so influential until I was midway through, of course this happens, right? realize that these paintings you love are there in your head as you're doing it and they it just you're kind of driven by by a passion for things that precede you so I wasn't conscious of it until I started realizing these books were around the studio and um, 
And I think this is there, obviously, from the heads turning into life forms. <clears throat> this was, a, I, I was lucky to find a really huge warehouse space, um, despite the fact that real estate is atrocious in Vancouver. Um, and started making this, I just wanted to show you the kind of process. It's, it was pretty, pretty huge, making a mural by hand. Never done. I usually work really small. And then um, it was an old cooler, actually. It was an organic, uh, an organic food depot, uh, vegetable and fruit depot. And, uh, and then these are close-ups of what I ended up doing. So you can see how I, I took that idea of the sampling and keeping track of the um, materials and turned it into part of the work because I was quite interested in the taxonomic look of it. Um, so kind of taking this uh, scientific approach, pseudo-scientific look and writing down what the form is because I was literally pouring down the materials after I did a loose drawing and then um, with an eyedropper was throwing in bitumen but also red iron oxide and um, kind of more natural pigments into them and not really knowing how they were going to turn out and sometimes they would breach as you can see with the red purse sponge suddenly they would, there would be this huge if you put too much paint down, there would be this huge breach, and I quite like that because it reminded me of the breaching of the tailing ponds. You know, it happens all around the world every day. There's disasters, right? So it's like, here's a chance for me to talk about materials and actually have this stuff happen on a small scale. <clears throat> so these are close-ups of the works, which um, are not readily available with the mural, but I thought it was important to document and show this is like a little guinea pig, which I love. I love this one. <laughs> and it's just by chance, these things just have no idea how they're going to turn out. Um, any questions about, I, I might not be explaining it as well as I should because I, I know my work too much, but this always happens. And so what I, what I quite, what I found really fascinating is that um, because of the eyedropper um, and the way that the paint just wants to, I, mean, I think, I think of this as pure painting in a way, I think of the materials just wanting to flow in a certain way. Obviously you're anticipating and you're working with it so you can kind of guide it to a certain extent. But um, it, it ends up taking on this cellular look as if you're looking under a microscope and I was quite pleased by that too. So you can be, you could see it as kind of this, this view from above, like a tailing palm, but you can also see it as something under a microscope. And uh, and then uh, I was uh, using my interest in animation to go from one form to another. So the formal qualities of the entire thing were also very intentional. That there were these huge leaps between forms, that there would be this kind of morphing from one thing to another. And um, the only fictitious creature, <clears throat> so it goes from kind of microbial life and rocks to uh, megafauna, mammals at the top, no humans, um, because I'm trying to be non-human and non-anthropocentric, um, unlike the chain of being. Um, but the one fictitious creature is the one at the very, very corner, which is the Ouroboros, which is the, um, the way that everything connects. And it was a vision that um, August Kekulé, a, a, a German chemist who's kind of a founder of chemistry, had this vision of the benzene ring, which is the kind of most primal uh, petrochemical um, structure. Uh, and he had this vision of the Ouroboros before he discovered the chemical structure of petrochemicals. And so I thought that that was pretty significant to put the snake biting its own tail and also thinking about ourselves biting ourselves um, as uh, you know very fallible creatures, uh, destructive creatures. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's what I've been doing lately. And I I don't know. <laughs> I just thought it would be fun to show you what has happened most immediately. I'll just start quickly. I um, the 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 way that. Uh, my art making life has panned out in the last 
10 years that I came out, of, I came out of grad school, I actually studied with Marina, she was my advisor. Um, the way it started was that I came out of grad school as broke as any student with $50,000 in debt. And I started teaching, but I found it quite, though very inspirational and um, remarkably interesting from what I learned from my students, I wanted to be a full-time artist, and those options were quite sparse for me as an art, as a as a young person coming out of grad school with you know not a very wealthy background and a lot of student loans. So um, gradually, I realized that there's a lot of facility and infrastructure in doing residencies. So I started to aggressively apply to quite a few residencies around uh, Canada and also abroad. Most of them were abroad, and those residencies. Um, in their structure, which is, if, if somebody hasn't done or don't know what residencies are, it's basically a hosting foundation or a gallery or an institution will basically bring you in as an artist to do research. Sometimes it's exhibition based at the end of the research or sometimes it's just to do research or learn from the site. And they have a, ideally they have a stipend for you so you get paid to be there and they have an apartment for you to live in and a potentially, if you're lucky, a studio. Um, especially as a young artist, those those options were you know sparse. So I started doing a lot of residencies because they gave me enough um, enough room and just enough time to make work. But then gradually that became the very structure that informed a lot of what I did. So when I go to a residency, I kind of, if it's, if it's exhibition based, if there's an objective to have an exhibition at the end of my stay there, um, I start doing research, which I use really loosely, which it could engulf, or um, uh, include um, what I call loitering, like hanging around and just understanding potentially what an environment of a space feels like, the ecology, and then I also read about that space, obviously, or, and then the influences can be anything from uh, architectures or uh, economies or certain kind of uh, ticks that <laughs> seem to feel inspirational, but also reflective of the space that I'm trying to negotiate. Um, and part of the objective is to also not be presumptuous, and that fi I find really complicated and difficult, because I don't want to come into a new space or a new country or a new city and kind of have a presumption that I'm going to make, you know, like I'm going to make toilets to save Africa or something. This kind of, this, it's been models of residencies like that in the past that I want to be very wary of. Um, so, amongst all that mess, <laughs> I've been trying to negotiate a practice that's mostly site-related and that I'm influenced by, those, by that environment that I'm working in, and oftentimes the work stays there or doesn't have a second life in other locations. Um, but part of what's been satisfying about these residencies is that um, the type of audience that these residencies bring in are very unlike what a white cube gallery would bring in. So I do residencies in houses or in weird warehouses or strange studios and then the exhibition space is also often, not always, but sometimes ideally an alternative space to a white cube gallery. Um, but because of the fact that I'm engaging or trying to engage with certain concerns that are relevant to that space or that environment or that habitat or whatever, um, the people who come to the space are often more often than not, quite well informed about the things that I'm trying to engage with. So it's not, a, it's not like I have a kind of a, a painting or sculptural practice that is only studio based and then I kind of ship it around different spaces and then people come and look at the work as a kind of, ex, like I have an expertise practice to what I make. So there's a kind of vulnerability. Every time I make work, I might at best have like 70% of a complete work in its, in its in its, not in its formation, but in its potential. And then people come in, and I've had locals who are not in the arts come in and kind of call me on my uh, shortcomings, or do the opposite, where they kind of bring in a lot of information that really contributes to my relationship to the work, but also to the environment. Um, and I've gotten some really interesting audience members that I would have never uh, predicted, uh, including people who've built houses that I've ended up doing residencies in. Um, anyway, so that's the that's the, infrastructure that has kind of given voice to me as an artist. Part of doing these residencies is also remarkably stressful because you arrive, I generally have nothing in mind other than a kind of a, what I, like a sediment of research and ideas that I'm always kind of curious, like Marina and I are both in dialogue about our research a little bit. 
but I tend to go in and try to make work that really jolts me outside of my own habits, so it becomes a kind of a non-expertise relationship to what I make. Um, anyway, so it can be very stressful, and I've had some really uh, strange and negative experiences. Um, long story short, this is the latest residency that I did in Bogota, um, in Colombia, and I was invited to do a residency at a foundation called Flora, and I, this is the building actually, so this is the top of the roof of the building, and I was there for a month, uh, and I was a, supposed to do an exhibition which last minute, excuse me, fell through because I felt so inspired by the city and how I was absorbing my relationship to that environment that I actually had nothing to output. And so I needed time to kind of reflect on what I wanted to make, but I wanted to make this piece called, well, it's called Kids, Cats, and One Dog. Uh, I tend to make a lot of work, well, I'm trying to, and I have done in the past, works that are trying to do deal with aerial views as opposed to uh, horizontal or front views. So I do works on roofs of buildings or shadows in order to um, address a more bird's eye view that could be, I guess now it would be, what are those, drone oriented, but I'm actually, I never think about drones. I don't think they're something I want to yeah. engage with. Yeah, more airplanes, helicopters, bird's eye view. So kind of a more of an urgency or a kind of an SOS call. And this piece, it kind of rides two, two things that I had in mind. Um, <laughs> Currently, I'm, and that when I was at this residency, I was really trying to renegotiate ideas around success that young artists inherit through their professors or through their uh, through blogs and magazines and ideas around what a, what, a, what a successful artist is and how sometimes, in my experience, even more recently, I feel like more and more ideas of success are around just uh, an, an accumulation of wealth and a kind of a middle class standard as opposed to uh, maintaining a practice. So success and pr and maintaining a practice are kind of blurred in a really strange way for me. So I was really interested in this saying in kids, cats, and one dog, which sounds like a really idealized middle class family um, space. But then I was also thinking about that kind of urgency or that kind of, especially with the stuff Marina talked about, environment and these issues of precarity of economy and uh, ecology and all these things about um, those ambitions kind of coming afloat, like almost uh, becoming literally arising to a point of uh, uh, having nowhere to go but to drown potentially. So this is from New Orleans, and when the flood waters would come in, uh, the residents would go to the roof because the water was elevating so quickly that they would write who's in that, who's still living in these attics, and the helicopters would land if they ever showed up. Uh, to rescue the occupants of the house or the remaining occupants. So you can see here it says people, dog, and one people, one dog, one cat. So I was trying to kind of play on these um, SOS calls while at the same time having an element of nostalgia in, these, in this, in this uh, rooftop painting. These are, these are just from the news I've taken now. They're very disturbing and remarkable images. And this, I don't know, like this is in there, this is stupid. But I Googled the kids, cats, and one dog, and this is what I got. So there's two dogs and one cat in there. But it, it was a kind of a, a fantasy. <laughs> um, and I was just going to show some images of artists who have been really influenced by it. So this is not an innovative gesture by any means. It's part of a tradition of this kind of text-based uh, advertising. Uh, this is Jenny Holzer, Lawrence Wiener. And so this is what it looks like. And it's a permanent piece now on the roof of the uh, foundation. If you go to Bogota, go to Flora. It's a foundation that Jose Roca runs. And it deals strictly with artists who are interested in uh, issues around ecology and the environment. And they bring in a lot of like Amazonian medicine artists and local, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, medicine, doctor, me, um, me, medicine doctors and artists from indigenous populations from the Amazon and other different people from different places. But it's very, very incredible space. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. So in, 
is this a family home too that has kids can't smoke? It used to be. Yeah. No, no, no. This is the foundation now, but it used to be a family home. Yeah. Yeah. I just wondered if there was. There, there had been. Yeah, these would have been uh, like family units yeah. that they occupied. Yeah. So the way you can see this piece is that there's another building that the foundation has that is higher. So when you go to the top of the roof where there's a garden, if you look over, you see this piece upstairs. Um, and so I was, I've been looking at these. I'm just, I'm just mostly showing residency-based works, uh, and then a few others if there's time dealing with this kind of signs that I put out into the public. I did a residency in 2010 in uh, Santander in Spain. I'm going to speed through this because I realize that time is sparse. But um, so I went to <laughs> a big pause. I went to Santander in Spain and I did a residency in this really immaculate house. And the residency was run by Mona Hatoum, actually. And um, while I was there, it was during the 2010 World FIFA, found, FIFA uh, uh, competition, the tournament, and Spain was obviously competing, and I was living in, I was staying in Spain, and during our, when we were checking into the uh, studios and the hotels that we were doing the residency at, the guy who was checking us in, he said to one of the German guys, he said, oh, you're the enemy right now, and I said, why is he the enemy? He goes, oh, because we're playing against them next, the next tournament, the next match, essentially, and it was a kind of a strange thing as a hosting body to call a guest an enemy and a lot of my practice or work deals with the idea of hospitality and when I was a student with Marina's guidance actually I learned about how, uh, this art, uh, writer Elaine Scary who talks about the etymology of the word um, house which is host and that etymology forks into two other words of different meanings which is um, so house and then hospital, hospitality, but also hostage, hostility. So there's always this kind of potential of the domestic space kind of inverting or becoming the nightmare or, or the nourishing, you know, healthy environment. So hospitality has been part of what I've been looking at a lot and the domestic space and these kinds of negotiations with, to me, that border can extend from the balcony, which is a slightly pu more public space, but then it can go to the backyard, which is what kind of this show is dealing with, the neighbors. And then from there, it can extend to how we negotiate with wilderness, but I also, that's kind of domesticating wilderness. But for me, it's also that, that border or that threshold can also be a national border. It can be much larger than just a house. So it, it's interesting how those, those, those things become even more urgent now, seeing the hospitality of Canada or other, the way other nations perform hospitality towards refugees that are fleeing their own uh, countries. So anyway, so Spain, I was there. And so as soon as he said this, I thought, oh, I have this urge to just hang this massive German flag outside of my studio, which was in this very wealthy neighborhood where no sign of life was really visible, which is, I'm sure, it happens here too in more wealthy neighborhoods. You can't really hang your laundry out in public, and you can't really show signs of too much life, too much laborious domestic space into the, into the public sphere. So I decided to collect laundry from all of the resident artists and start to make laundry lines that were quite obscene, you can see with the underwear here, that matched the flags of the countries playing against Spain during the FIFA championship. I, I was actually a Spain fan myself, like I was really happy that they were winning. But I wanted to kind of insert this, this um, projected hostility where you see as a, the laundry is obscene maybe potentially, but also like the patriotism of a Spanish or like any person who's got this kind of heightened patriotism, um, they would almost see their animosity towards a nation in a coincidental color coordination. Um, and actually, though I thought it was a really benign gesture and a kind of a playful one, we got several letters, the news crew came down, they wanted to take down the work, they thought it was really obscene, um, and then luckily Mona Hatoum, who had enough clout and power to fight for the work, she said if the work comes down, then we, don't, we won't do the residency. And so they fought back and they kept the work going. But I, I, it, was, it was kind of funny for me to see the level of antagonism from something, something so benign. Um, and then I did another residency. This is going to get more and more descriptive. The, the, the unfortunate scenario of talking about site-specific work was, is that it has so much to do with the experience. And then when you give a slideshow, it's just you're basically translating the work and speeding up a, a narrative that's not really 
a story, but rather an experience. So I did a residency in London, UK, near the um, near the Buckingham Palace, very close, in this house that this uh, foundation had just bought, and it used to be um, a missionary school. But I didn't want to deal with those things, so I'm just going to give an example of how I dealt with another domestic space. The piece is called uh, um, Study for a Garden, and it was a four-floor house, and all we did was we, I removed all the furniture from the house and I did a series of interventions. This is in 2012, a series of interventions through the house, including a row of hedges that blocked the entrance. So not only did you come in, but there was another second entrance or kind of a backyard threshold that you had to really negotiate trespassing into. And part of my interest in, with the hedges is that they've been so instrumental in dividing the common lands historically from a space that was shared between peasants and the aristocrats, but rather became privatized through this kind of naturalized border, or like using nature to normalize or naturalize the aesthetic of a, of a giant fence, essentially. So you come through this entrance, you go through this threshold, I can't describe this work because it's really laborious to talk about it. Anyway, there's this kind of a funny table that drips. <laughs> this is actually a waterboarding. It's a makeshift waterboarding torture table. So I don't have any proper slides of, or video of this, but basically uh, water would trickle down. There's a mechanism that I built with a fountain where one drop per second or so would drip down from that cloth from the top to the second cloth, and then it would drip down and it was kind of reminiscent of water torture. None of this was actually disclosed to the viewer. They were just basically, they would come in, they would get a key, and they would walk through the house on their own. <clears throat> and I painted a false bruise with coffee, turmeric, and oil on the roof of the ceiling. So these kinds of disjointed discrepancies between the sound you heard and you thought it was dripping from the ceiling, but actually there was no leak. And then you leave the living room to go upstairs, where this carpet and these doors, this kind of plant ornament was very much in the house. And then I planted the most invasive plant species, which is an English ivy, into the floors. And throughout the exhib exhibition, the, throughout the two months, these ivies kind of grew and overtook more and more of the space and kind of blended in with this kind of fake oriental, orientalist machine-made carpet nice. spaces. And then, you would go upstairs in the third floor bedroom. Oh, I need your audio. Oh, sorry. It's okay. It's probably fine. You would go upstairs to the third floor where this, this piece, which was the oscillating water sprinkler, was in the room for three, two months um, throughout the exhibition. It's called Fountain. This is the room in its entirety. And so part of the objective was to kind of just overlap what could be in the shed of a house and then somehow become, make it so antagonistic to the domestic space. Because I don't think the outside and the inside are such a binary. It's just like these kind of invisible borders that are kept. So, And then the kitchen, which was the dining room in the basement of the house, had this table which is um, called dirt table, and it's six feet long, three feet wide, and it's just compressed soil. There's no adhesives or glass or anything, and it's just a compression of 600 kilograms of soil kept together with just with moisture and pressure. But it's kind of uh, high enough and, and, and long enough to house a body, potentially. And the premise was that nothing would grow, nothing would grow, um, the soil was the piece. There was, there was no intention to grow anything out of the soil, so we would remove any kind of sign of life uh, from the soil, topsoil. So I'm just gonna to contextualize the work upstairs, just show a couple more pieces. This is one of the hedges that I made, something similar to this is upstairs. And then in Quebec City, I made another piece of the kind of a lineage of this piece where there was a show, um, I was invited to participate in a triennial, a Quebec City triennial, and I looked for these desire lines, desire paths, which is when there's a kind of a overly populated grass patch. People will create their own shortcuts, and then, you know, they're maintained by the, by the back and forth of the public. 
And this is a very, very uh, highly, uh, what do you call it, frequented one in Quebec City. So I planted, for the opening of the show, I planted about, I think it's like 75 or 75 trees or so we planted uh, with the help of these uh, gardeners that we paid. And we planted these trees. And then I had a kind of a floor, a kind of a model in mind that we followed. And then throughout the exhibition, we would go in maybe at nighttime often and remove the trees. And then, so I'll give you a sense of what they look like. So this is the first day. This is a week in, two weeks in, three weeks in. And then we would cover up any kind of sign of grass. Because this was a perfect space to do this too, because it was enough. The grass was imperfect enough that you could hide any sign of these plants being uprooted and replanted. And it was a kind of a pathetic barrier. And later I was told that, well, during install, I was told that a lot of the G20 protests took place in this part of it. This kind of a politicized space in the city. So I don't know, maybe the psyche of the city tapped into something I was thinking about, or I kind of coincidentally landed on something. <laughs> yeah, and then we donated the trees to a school yard, and they, after the show, they used it. Um, I'm trying to think of what, how much time we have, because I don't want to overdo. How are we doing with time? I would like to make, leave room for questions as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, it's almost 7 now, so uh, we could wrap up. But if there's a couple more important things you have to say, like we don't have to be out of the theater just yet. So if there's a couple of more important things that you want to say, and then we can open it up for questions. Sure, should I show the animals? Yeah. Yeah, and so I'll just show this one piece, and then we can. Um, recently, I was asked to participate in the Montreal Biennial, and even when I'm making a work in a gallery, I tend to, if given the opportunity, uh, I tend to make new work that deals with the subject matter of the show. It seems like a really nice opportunity to kind of, I don't know, hijack something to make a work that may fail or pass. So anyway, so the show was called Futurity, and I asked him if I could make new work for the show. And one of the pieces in the show is uh, this piece, which is temporary tattoos that I designed based on kind of weirdly Russian, Russian constructivist hard edge paintings and stuff like that. Um, the piece is called Fatigues, which is a pun on camouflage, but also exhaustion. And so the tattoos were distributed through the kids center at the Mac. And since they were shown again, they were shown like, so they're always kind of distributed discreetly through the children's program or something like that. And then they, basically these are temporary tattoos that pollute the features of the face if you put enough of them that the face recognition technology on cameras don't work as well. So you know when you're trying to, when you're on your Facebook page, if you don't have a Facebook page, don't feel obliged. But if you do, you, when you, you know, it will show that square, it's because the camera recognizes that it, those features. And if you pollute the symmetry of the eyes and the nose and the mouth, it just reads as an object, not a, not a human or an animate or a living thing, I guess, maybe, I don't know. So this was one of the works that was distributed. So sometimes you would just see kind of herds of kids running around with weird patterns on their faces throughout the exhibition. Uh, the second body of work that was in the show, um, so this is a really beautiful artwork that's not mine. Andrew uh, Bowers. Yes, Andrew Bowers. It's a remarkable piece. Um, my piece is on the corner bottom right hand. So throughout the exhibition, I had found, I worked with uh, taxidermists and we found animals that were sourced not through trapping, but rather through collisions with buildings and cars or for hunting purposes only, or population control. So we source these animals, and then I work with taxidermists to taxidermy them to look like they're either passed out or dead. And so I'll just show a series of them. This is an owl, obviously. It's a, there's, uh, this is a really beautiful piece by another really talented Canadian artist. From I know, I don't remember this one. So yeah, he's really an amazing painter. There's, he has paintings in there. and. You should look up his work. Nicholas? Yes. Bear? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, Jennifer. You so win. Come on down. <laughs> um, so my work is that little orange blob on the left-hand corner. And so these animals were shown with no labels or any kind of didactic panel or anything. They were just, once the show was up and the lighting was kind of 
set up, I went and dispersed these animals throughout the gallery in kind of mostly poor lit areas um, and in kind of close sight lines so you wouldn't see them from far away. So you couldn't figure them out until you were quite close to them. And there's another left hand corner, that little dot is the flicker bird. And then past Nicholas Bayer, what's his name, Nicholas Bayer? Nicholas Bayer. Yeah, that's the big shiny object is his, uh, which actually says eternity, if you could read it from above. So it was a kind of funny coincidence that I, and so this is my piece. We, yesterday we went for a walk and we saw a yellow warbler. It was incredible the way it was singing. And so I, I was like, oh, it's so sad. I have a dead yellow warbler. Um, so yeah, so let's just, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the, those are the fatigues that I showed in Montreal. Um, and then at the end of the exhibition, like at the very last room, there's a label that actually talks about, like says what the piece is, like says it's called fatigues with my information. But you don't see it until the very last, you know, and it, there's, um, there's one small bird near it, so it's very inconspicuous. And on the list, though, is uh, all the animals that are in the exhibition, plus some animals that are actually not in the exhibition, including like a black bear, a gray wolf, uh, um, a goose hawk. And so this idea that there's a phantom animals or uh, missing animals that people go looking for, because once they think they've seen them few, they, go, they keep searching them out. And part of it was to simply put, was to talk about the way that we experience animals because of our ecological footprint is that their perpetual state of death or their absence, um, especially for more urban settings, obviously. So the idea that the bear wouldn't be in the gallery because it's missing twice is part of that kind of strategy. Can we turn on the light so we can see that? Very patient, nice people. <laughs> Thank you.